Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, the Flames are four games into their five-game road trip, and Matt, I asked my Magic 8-Ball today, will the Flames ever lose again? And the Magic 8-Ball looked at me and said, not a chance. So here we come, rest of the season, big win streak. As always, I'm Dan alongside Matt, and we're here to talk about the great week of Flames hockey. How you doing, Matt? Good. You see, this is all your fault. Last week, during our weekly predictions, prior to that, you were giving me a hard time because, oh, I either say win them all or lose them all. So I decided to go middle of the road and be, you know, accommodating to, you know, greater chance of being right. Should have just stuck with my guns and said, go for or no. Well, no, no it, hockey's a game of tradition and superstition. So now you've got to go middle of the road until this win streak's over. Oh, for sure. <laughs> like, literally, until it's over. Yep. you got to put your... 500 you gotta do er- all the way. <laughs> everything you did last week the same way. you got to drink, you know, your, you got to, you know, put your headphones on the same earphone first. You got to do everything the same way until we go on a, until we lose a game. Exactly. <laughs> well, it's been a, it's been a heck of a road trip. Let's jump right into it. The Flames uh, started this road trip on Det- in Detroit on the 21st of October, and this was after the sort of shaky uh, start to the season when they lost Edmonton, lost to Anaheim, and I think we both said, you know what, they should be able to beat Detroit. I thought that uh, you thought they might lose Detroit, but we both said they should be able to win this one, and they did. Eureka! Yeah. Markstrom got his uh, his shutout in this one. He made 33 saves, and Lindholm scored in the third or in his third straight game for the Flames this season, as Calgary routed the Red Wings 3-0. Goals from Lindholm, Mongepani, and Kachuk's first of the year. What do you want to say about this one, Matt? Well, I thought that the Flames, uh, like in the first couple of games, they were very much uh, controlling the play more, and basically, like with the shot totals, like they were in like the mid-40s, and a lot more focus on generating shots more so than uh, good scoring chances. And I think that in this one, the Flames got the lead, and then they just hang it on until the Red Wings, they gave it their all, especially in the third period, but the Flames just weathered the storm, played the nice tight defensive game, let Detroit do what they were going to try to do, and manage the game all the way to an easy 3 nothing win. And then that's something we'll talk about for a lot of this week, but the Flames have been able, I think the story of this road trip so far, is the Flames have been able to rise to challenges and not give up when they get challenged. Yeah, and it's a stark difference from past seasons where the Flames, like if the going got tough, they got going. And there's a lot more resiliency even if, like in a later game against New Jersey, a couple of questionable goals by the goaltender, and yet they didn't collapse because of it. Yeah, I and, think that's the story of this whole trip. Yeah. Well, let's jump to the next game then. The Flames beat the Red Wings, rode that high into an 11 a.m. game, which usually spells disaster for this team. Matinees are usually like the kryptonite for the Flames. Um, but they they went into the U.S. Capitol. They put their backup goaltender in. I think surprising a lot of people that Dan Vladar or Dan Vladar got his first uh, start of the regular season and got a win in a 4-3 win for the Flames over the, uh, the Washington Capitals. I think that it did make a lot of sense to start Vladar in this one just due to the fact that for routines, having uh, Markstrom disrupt everything to start so early in the day, like, especially, like, you look at matinees, like, usually the Flames struggle, so at this point, like, if you kind of pencil it in as a loss anyway, (laughs) it makes sense to start the backup, and he got two points. I agree. Some interesting milestones here. Lindholm uh, scores three goals, including the winner in OT. This is his first hat trick as a flame and his second of his career. And Johnny Goudreau, who got the... Which goal did he assist on? He got the assist on the OT goal to get his 500th career point. He's only the eighth flame to do so. So that's uh, pretty impressive. I thought in this game, one thing I noticed is Lindholm looked like he did a little bit of everything with his team. He was... Back checking, he was four checking, he was going to the corners, he was passing, he was shooting. Like, he looked like the most complete guy on the ice in this game. Yeah, he seems to have taken another step in his development. 
and it, he is literally looking like a high quality first line center which that would be amazing if that keeps true the flames had only two shorthanded goals the entire season last year and in this game they had their they had one shorthanded goal now in game four so they're already beating some milestones um, yeah but- that goal was amazing by the way it was. It was a good goal. Lindholm's effort on that was just spectacular. If you got, if anyone hasn't seen it, that was the first period goal, the third goal of the first period, the uh, the Flames three nothing goal. So you can go back and watch the highlights on that. But Matt, I thought too, this was a tale of almost two periods. That first period, I thought was to this point probably the best Flames period of the season, and then the second period looked very different. The Capitals came back and played like we expect the Washington Capitals to play. But as you said earlier. When the going got tough, the Flames didn't get going. They stuck with it. They played their game, and it helped them. Um, you know, it helped them win the game. Yeah, and like if you look at the goals, the Kuznetsov goal, that was a really bad play by Gaudreau, and things like that do happen. And, but last year, like the team would have completely fallen apart. And then the second goal, uh, Shillington made a bad read at covering Wilson instead of the guy that scored. And that happens. It's unfortunate that the Flames didn't have another player in that area to cover the guy who scored the goal. But it's, you know, like little things happen. Then Ovechkin scores, but, you know, give me a break. It's Ovechkin. He does that with everybody. Uh, You know, like the Flames normally, like especially with it being tied heading into the third period, if this was last year, you're probably looking at a 7-3 Capitals win. And yeah, I think you're right. It, but the Flames instead only allowed five shots in the third period and then controlled overtime. Yep. And if you look at the, that goal, um, like it, what I mentioned last week with the Anaheim uh, play where Monaghan and Hannafin, like they could have just bumped the puck back to the goalie because they both had pressure and they could have just went that route instead. Matthew Kachuk had a similar amount of pressure in that situation and kicked it back to Vladar, who ended up getting his first NHL point on that play. I think you're totally right about the 7-3 victory. I think that, you know, the the real change that we're seeing is the team being able to persevere and play 60 minutes of hockey. How often have you and I said they're playing 20, they're playing 40, they're yeah. letting another team in for one period. And even when the other teams are coming back, the Flames are, are playing their game. And I think there's the first time, I mean, we talked about this a few weeks ago, the Flames have an identity and they know what the game they're supposed to play is and we're seeing them playing that. Yeah, and it's one of those situations where like you, you almost have to force the other team to beat you. And if they do, like, say, with Washington coming back, Washington is off to a hot start. They're already a good team. So, like, you have that expectation that they're going to be good. You got up 3 nothing. You know they're going to be coming at you and throwing everything in the kitchen sink at you to get back in the game. They did, but the Flames were able to say, okay, you, you did your thing. Now it's our turn and carried the torch the rest of the way. They sure did. And they did that in the next two games as well. They're back-to-back games uh, in and around New York. They went on the 25th on Monday night to play the Blue Shirts, the New York Rangers, in uh, New York. And big win in this one, a 5-1 win for the Calgary Flames over the New York Rangers. Um, I thought Markstrom looked really good in this game. And interesting, I had in my notes here of all the forward lines, I thought that the Lindholm line was probably the least noticeable in this game. Yeah, I can agree with that. Um, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. I mean, not everybody can be hot every night, but a lot of a lot of guys getting hot in this game. We had Tanev get his first goal. We had uh, Backlund get his first goal. Um, Coleman got his second goal, which was uh, Backlund and Pitlick's first points of the season, I believe, on that one. So uh, a lot of a lot of guys getting getting hot in this game, and I think. It's always tough, I find, to predict what you're going to get with the Rangers. Like they're a team that is going through a bit of a, a redevelopment and a change, and some nights they look really hot, and some nights they don't. But I thought the Flames did a good job of neutralizing the the hot players in this team. I didn't notice Panarin much at all. I didn't notice Fox at all. Like I thought the Flames did a good job of shutting down the Rangers. Yeah, and like even Lafreniere and uh, Kako, like they did not 
like I didn't even know that they were playing and like you know like it, it's it was a very good defensive effort I thought by the Flames like they didn't really allow the Rangers much space or opportunity to like it, even in the third period when uh, the Rangers scored that goal to draw within one the Flames responded like two minutes later to re-extend the lead and then just kept the foot on the gas the rest of the way when I was looking at the stats here I've written in my notes I think uh, it's crazy to see some of the time on ice here um, Ryan Reeves played 102 like, yeah. can you imagine going to work and, and working for a minute and two seconds? I know. It's like, uh, why bother even dress that particular guy? Like, well, that's it. I almost want to go and see what they're paying him, divided by 82, and figure out what he got paid for his minute and two seconds on the ice. Like, I don't know. There's got to be a better body to dress. I know. Like, even on the Flames, like, if you look at the time on ice, uh, Lucic and Richie had, were the two lowest stuff for the forwards and they still had 12 minutes of ice yep. time and you know and get the flames were rolling four lines all night and yeah it's just one of those interesting decisions by the other team i i guess with reeves they were basically if lucic starts messing with people then have him go fight lucic but yeah lucic was just being well behaved <laughs> Another interesting thing for the Flames in this game was uh, there was only six uh, penalty minutes, four for each team, but every Flame got power play time. Sometimes it was short, like uh, Shillington got five seconds, but every Flames player went on on the power play. Which is a good thing. And uh, like especially especially at the end of the game with that last power play that Mungipane scored a second on, uh, I think uh, like it, them not putting out the... Goodrow Lindholm line and allowing the depth guys to get some power play time, I think was a nice reward for their efforts in the game. I totally agree. And um, then we've got the next night, the Flames were in New Jersey. Dan Vlad, Dan Vladar back in the net here. And uh, he got into a little bit of trouble in this game, but the Flames still managed to win 5-3 over the New Jersey Devils. I thought that... Uh, Overall, I think the story of this game might have been Vladar, and he looked like, I mean, in his in his first start against Washington, he looked really good. Here he sort of looked like an unproven backup, which is exactly what he is. Well, I, I think that, actually, I'm going to say that if the, the game was going to play out the way it did, I'm glad that the goals that happened happened in this game where the Flames were still able to win the game because of the fact that, you know, like, the first goal that New Jersey scored, that was a really dumb, bad play by Vladar. No excuse for it. Like, you, you literally cannot pass it to the opposition forward standing in front of the net while you're behind it. Like, it's, you know, a clear bad error. He's a young goalie, and he will remember that of don't do the stupid thing. And and especially, like, even the, the second goal with where his helmet was broken and that, like, he should have had the knowledge to just shake the helmet off and just wait for the referee to blow the whistle because his mask was broken instead of allowing the play to develop and them to score. You know, that's, a, that's a good point, and that probably could have shaken his confidence more if the Flames were lost because of that. Yeah, but, you know, like, learning those lessons, like, especially as a young player, like, if you look at, like defensemen like say like Shillington or TJ Brody in the past when they were in their rookie seasons they would screw up something in a similarly like drastic way that would result in a goal against but they would learn from it and improve their game and you know that Vladar is not going to be going oh I have the puck behind the net let's not pass it to the you know he's going to be doing the more conscientious okay, these are my options, and do the, the right thing from now on. And, you know, it, those kind of things, like, it's a very good teaching and growing tool. And, frankly, like, I would like uh, Vladar to start one of the next handful of games, whether it's, like, the Nashville game coming up or something like that, just to, like, okay, yeah, that happened, but we're not going to drop you out of the rotation because of that happening. You know, For sure, and, and we talked about this. 
we talked about this previously too. I think the Flames now have put money into a proper goaltending staff. I mean, we've seen other teams that had goaltending coaches and assistant goaltending coaches and, you know, f- f- goaltending coaches who are there to rub their feet and all sorts of, un- I'm just kidding with that one, but, you know, we have more than just Jordan Siglet now. And I think that, you know, they, they have the right infrastructure in place to work with a young goaltender like Vladar for the first time. Yeah, and I think that those things will allow him to understand just the better decision making on the fly and like after the capitals game um sutter was uh, mentioning like shillington needing to be better on the ferrari goal and that that was you know a good way of approaching it like yeah you made a mistake and this is why you made the mistake and you have to le- learn like time and place for those kinds of things but did you see Shillington get his ice time reduced in the Devils game? No, of course not. Or the Rangers game. He went right back with them. And I think that that will help to build confidence in guys like Shillington and Vladar. Like, yeah, you can screw up, but as long as you're learning from those mistakes, you know, you and, can And grow. when you're winning, the, the coaching staff's going to have more tolerance to let you learn from those mistakes, not Ryan Reeves, Reeves you and put you on the bench after a minute and a half. Exactly. So Which I think the, win, the winning that, helps with that. Yeah, and the, like that to me is like the key way of an important way of actually getting young players to develop because stuff like that happens with mm-hmm. every young player in the NHL. Like they're... You know, it doesn't matter if you're a forward or a defenseman or a goaltender. Like, you're going to make stupid mistakes because you're just not well, used even to veterans. It. I mean, you talked in the last game about a big, uh, you know, a Goudreau mistake that led to a goal. Yeah, true. And, you know, and those things do happen. And, you know, you go, oh, geez, <laughs> afterwards. But as long as you're being able to be given the opportunity to learn properly from those mistakes and not have to worry about oh well now you know Zadorov is going to come in or I'm not going to see the ice time for a month you know like it, it's one of those things that like that in level of encouragement I think will be huge for those players moving forward I agree and I think this was the first game on the road trip I don't know about you but when I was watching this New Jersey game this is the first one where it felt like the Flames might have blown their lead yeah even then uh, I mean, they got up early, and then New Jersey started to push back, and I just didn't know if Calgary would be able to sustain the pressure when New Jersey started in the third to really battle back. Yeah, and I, how would you say, uh, this was, a, to me, a good test. Um, because, like, yeah, New Jersey did push, and they did draw within one, and at one point, I think. Um, or no, the, it, within two. And, you know, like, they were putting some pressure on but the flames like even though like the the devils at the end there were coming at them in waves it it, they still played their game and they were they were still able to just manage the clock and run it down and run it down until the game ended and i think that one of the things that the flames need to learn overall is how to Deal with a team that is throwing everything in the kitchen sink at you. And that's going to come, like you said, with confidence, I think, a lot of it. Yeah, and, you know, like, learning to manage games. Like, yeah, okay, the Devils scored to make it 5-2. Okay, great. Did they really change their game much from that point? No. No. And I think the moral of the story this whole road trip is play your game and you'll do well. You might not win every game, but you'll, you'll be competitive. Yeah, exactly, and I think that that's where, uh, like, the Flames, over the last, you know, recent memory, uh, they haven't been able to have the level of maturity of, like, in situations where things happen like this, where you're up 5-1 and, you know, running down the clock, of getting into panic mode when the other team actually gets a little bit of success. Yep. Or like when Washington tied the game, the Flames didn't panic. They just kept doing their thing, and they rode the clock down to overtime and got the win. And it's one of those where 
this is why, like, back a couple years ago with that rant episode that I had, wanting Daryl Sutter or, you know, like a coach of that, the maturity starts from the coaching staff. Mm-hmm. And it oozes out from there through the team. And when you have a coach like Daryl who has won two cups, been to the finals a number of times, success everywhere. He knows what it takes in those situations and knows how to properly keep the bench in check so that way they're not reeling from when things are really going awry. And, you know, that's one of the main reasons why, like, back then I wanted Daryl or, you know, similar coach uh, was because of needing that stabilizing force and now you're starting to see that kind of thing that maturity in the Flames game which has not been here for a long time I saw a great tweet from one of our listeners this week who said the Flames are showing about as much emotion as Daryl no matter if it's good or bad they just keep doing the same thing and you know I mean when was the last time you saw Daryl react positively or negatively either he just keeps doing the same thing no matter what so they're sort of adopting that Daryl Sutter mantra yeah exactly and you know stuff happens uh, whether it's positive or negative and you know it's like if you win a game it's like okay is that going to impact the next one no because you're playing a different team and they don't care if you've won two or three or well, four I in think a row that's the important thing to look at is you got to look at each game as its own you know piece and not you know each game as part of a larger season when you're in the middle of it yeah, it's like the next game against Pittsburgh. Do, do the Penguins give a, a about Calgary coming in on a four-game winning streak? No, they want to beat us. So, you know, you have to not have that like, oh, well, we're just awesome mentality because we're on a four-game win streak. Then you get complacent and the other team wins. And I that's one of the things that, like, especially the New Jersey game was important to me because of the fact that the Flames came in on a three-game winning streak. They won two games in a row. They were on the third game in four nights. And then within, like, 12 minutes, they're up 4 nothing. You know, it's like, okay. <laughs> you know, that that's what you want to see. Is that, okay, yeah, you won three in a row. But there was no ego or, like, oh, we're just awesome. They, they went out and they outworked the Devils and got that huge lead and then were able to kind of take the foot off the gas the rest of the way. No, for sure. I think you're, you're totally right about that. And we'll see how that translates. I mean, the Flames didn't have a four-game winning streak all last season. This is their first one. And obviously I was teasing them to be on the show with my uh, prediction with the eight ball that they're never going to lose again. But I think that's really going to be now the challenge is when they have their loss – how do they rebound from that? And that was an issue we saw in the past is they'd go on a bit of a streak, then they'd lose, and they'd just keep losing. Yeah, and then that, like all parts of their game would fall apart, and they'd lose entire confidence in themselves and have to dig themselves out of their losing streaks. So I think that to me, I mean... I forget who said it, but there was some hockey, some, you know, good hockey mind that has said years and years ago, um, you can tell a lot about a team by how they react to a loss. Yeah. And I think that's what we need to see from this Flames team. Well, you know, and, and like you've even seen that thus far this season. Like they lost the first game of the season, which, you know, like if it wasn't for the power play, they possibly could have won that one. And then the, they went out and they had a really good effort against Anaheim again lost that one but then had a really good effort against Detroit and then another one against Washington and another one against the Rangers and another one against New Jersey and like if they were able to maintain the effort level win or loss like if they can keep that level consistent then I think that they will have very short losing streaks because if they're continuing to have the right effort levels that they should be able to carry on. I totally agree with you. Yep. I think, and, and I mean, we'll, we'll see what happens, right? That's all we can do is just see what happens from here on out. But I think that's going to be the big, uh, the big indicator. Uh Well, with that week, with the flames winning four in a row on the road, that now puts them second in the Pacific. Um, 
sadly still behind Edmonton. The Flames now have six games played, four wins, one loss, one overtime loss for nine total points. And Edmonton is sitting at uh, 5-0-0 for 10 total points. So we're getting there. We'll, we'll overtake Edmonton eventually, but it's nice to go from the basement to number two that quickly. Yeah, and you have to figure that, um, like, the Flames usually suck for lack of <laughs> grace at the beginning of seasons. Like, this is literally their best start since, like, 2009. And, you know, I, I think that might have been, like, their best start that time in, like, 10 years as well, back in 2009. So, like, the Flames usually, like, the first month of the season, like, if you're getting through it at 500, you're doing awesome. And so the fact that they're 4-1-1 one, and one is extremely impressive, and if they can keep it going through the last handful of games in the month, like, that would be just exactly what the doctor ordered. We'll see where they can get to. And uh, the other interesting stat here is if you look at the league leaders after this week, the league leaders for points, there's three players in the league tied for most points, Ale- or sorry, most goals. Alexander Vechkin has seven. Elias Lindholm and Andrew Mangiapane also tied for number one. And that's when's the last time you saw two flames in the, in the even if it wasn't a tie, in the number one goals category in the league? I know. Uh, it's... You know, I I should go back to, like, my outlandish predictions thing from before the season started, and where I said that uh, Manjapani would score 30 and change that to 40. Because, <laughs> you know, if he keeps this up, he might hit 30 by Christmas. Well, I think, what was it? I think uh, Peter Lombardi has said that if he keeps scoring at this pace, he could beat Gretzky's record. <laughs> I don't want to say it was Lombardi's. I could be wrong, but somebody after the last game, one of the media personalities tweeted that, and I, I've, I'd have to go back and, and double-check it. But, uh, yeah, I mean, obviously he's not going to get there, but you had mentioned in, a, in our prediction show that you thought that the World Championships really did a lot for his game, and we're definitely seeing that so far. Yeah, I think that, that he just needed to be a little bit more confident in himself and that World Championship, he because he was able to translate his game into a very successful gold medal performance in that tournament, that uh, I think that he he's came into this season with a lot more, like, I can be awesome, and, well, he's showing the NHL that, yeah, he is. <laughs> and, you know, I think it's interesting that you mention that, because I think that a large, a large part of that has also been um, sort of the change to the lines. And if you look at some of the lines, I mean, he's played, and, and I'll, I'll go through what the lines were as of the last game. Now, I think that we have to remember Daryl Sutter's trying to roll lines. Daryl Sutter's trying to get everybody equal play time. So our first line or fourth line, it really shouldn't matter in Sutter's system who's where. But it's interesting to see the pairings. Our quote-unquote first line was Johnny Goudreau, Elias Lindholm, Matthew Kachuk. Our second line was Coleman, Backlund, and Pitlick. Our third line, Mangiapane, Dubé, and Richie. And our fourth line, Milan Lucic, Son Monahan, and Trevor Lewis. When when was, Did you ever think you'd see Monahan on the fourth line, Matt? Oh, well, I, I actually want to talk about Monahan a little bit. Sure. And I think that it, it's interesting that they're doing that in... You see, Monahan throughout his career has not really been a good two-way player at all. And... It, you know, when he's scoring, he's awesome, but, you know, he's pretty much always been a liability defensively. And with him being starting on the fourth line, he has to focus on the defensive side of things. And, like, you know, like, if you threw Monaghan back up on the second line, like, he would be scoring basically at the same rate he always does. But I think that it's important not only for him uh, physically to get back up to speed after that hip surgery, but also to, for him to be able to have the ability to work on his defensive two-way game. Like, do I think that Monaghan will be playing on the fourth line all season? No. I, no. I think this is going to be, like, maybe a month more, if that, and then you'll see him being reasserted up the lineup. But I think it's important for him... to in order to take the next step in his game and his evolution. It's a conference builder. Yeah, uh, to be able to learn how to play a good, solid two-way game. Because if you have 
like your top three centers of Monahan, Backlund, and Lindholm all being good offensive players, but also extremely reliable defensive players, then that's the part where like you start looking at like teams that actually contend for Stanley Cups and such. Like their top three centers usually are very good at, at both ends of the ice. And, you know, you can't have a player like Monaghan who is a black hole at times defensively. So if Sutter is able to effectively teach Monaghan how to be that two-way guy, that will be a huge thing later on in the season, and if the Flames are in the playoffs, yada, yada, yada. But it it's just an interesting, like, how would you say it? Like, playing your $6.5 million player on the fourth line like, there's very few coaches that would be comfortable to take the heat from upstairs <laughs> to actually have the cojones to actually do that. Well, but... and and Monaghan's obviously got to sort of know what he's doing because a lot of times if that happens, your agent's making a phone call that day. So Monaghan's obviously, I want to say, he understands what the plan is. Yeah. And... Otherwise, we would have been seeing rumors already. Monaghan's agent calls, Monaghan wants out, all this sort of stuff. Oh yeah, for sure, and I think that, you know, and like especially with him still getting like first power play time, like that's the key indicator to me. It's not that, oh, you're being banished forever. It's like, no, we want you to be the offensive good player that you are, but we also want you to be as effective defensively. And, you know, like back when Monaghan was a young player and Sutter was coaching the Kings, like, uh, he referred to Monaghan as being a, like a young Anze Kopitar. And yet Monaghan didn't really develop on the defensive side like Kopitar did. So I'm gathering that with this whole thing that he's basically trying to teach him to play in a similar mold that Kopitar did. And, um... Yeah, and you're seeing, like, Monaghan actually engaging physically for, like, the first time in his career as well. And I think that, you know, like, there's no better teacher than to have somebody who had a player and won a cup, pair of cups with that player that he's trying to mold him into, I think. I can see that. I can also see this being a little bit of a thing where it's not just the defensive side, and I think you're totally right that this is going to help him defensively, but I'm wondering how much of this might be an offensive booster as well. Putting you on a line with guys like Lucic and Lewis, I mean, those are not guys that we're looking at for a lot of offense this year, so you are now the guy on that line. And I think when he was playing with, um, you know, Johnny, or when he was playing with, um, you know, Coleman in in the preseason and stuff like that he was one of many guys and I'm wondering if part of that line is being told not only has he got to get better defensively but get the puck to Sean and Sean you put that puck home like I wonder if this is also to sort of build him up offensively as being I've always questioned what Monaghan is sometimes he looks like he could be our scorer sometimes he looks like he's our playmaker sometimes he looks like our setup man I wonder if this is sort of bringing that confidence back of trying to make him the the finisher yeah, and I can see him... Yeah, like, it, it's very hard because of the fact that, like, there are gaps in his game. And, you know, if he can iron those out, like, he has the ability to be a very good two-way NHL player. And, you know, we'll see. It, it'll be definitely an interesting dynamic for this team moving forward. Like, if Monaghan can become that complete forward then all of a sudden you have, like, two really good two-way forwards as your top two centers, and all of a sudden the Flames have a different dynamic entirely. And while we're talking about the lineup, I really want to give uh, props to the what we'll call the second line here, Blake Coleman, Mikael Backlund, and Tyler Pitlick. I did not expect Tyler Pitlick to be a top six forward. I still don't know if I'd call him a top six forward, but a guy who I would say that line and that player particularly have been pivotal to the Flames' success this week. Well, when he was with Arizona, I actually liked Pitlick a lot because of the fact that he was always a player that seemed to care and would give like 100% effort, even though talent-wise... He's just there. Like, he's a... Uh, your prototypical third, fourth when liner in terms in Pitlick, of offense. I thought he's your third line guy who can move up to second in a pinch in an injury situation. Yeah, uh, but, like, the effort level is always there. Well, putting him with Coleman and Backlund, 
is just like the perfect combination because you have three guys that are all hard working two way forwards that have a little bit of offense. Now Pitlick's a little behind both Coleman and Backlund in terms of offensive ability, but he's not inept offensively. So, you know, he can definitely play the third hand on that wheel. And, you know, it'll be interesting to see that dynamic. Because, like, I'm assuming later on in the season that you'll see Monaghan with Dubé and Mungipane as, like, your second line. And that being your, the backline line being your third line. Interchangeable, but, you know what I mean? And I, I, and think I can the, see that backline line starting to get a lot of PK time. Yeah, exactly. And... It'll be interesting to see. Like the Flames, uh, I think, are definitely doing things the right way to build both internal confidence and like confidence in each line. A- and plus, I like uh, how thus far Dubé has been able to be given some space as a center as well, uh, just because it gives further options. Like in case the Flames decided to make trades and such. With you know, because of the whole. Well, and you and I talked about Dubé at center, and I think even outside of trades, it's another guy that we know can step in there should there be an injury. Exactly. I mean, I think we have three, maybe four centers without him, and who else do you put in there in an injury situation? Well, and I think that you know, as much as the whole Sam Bennett situation leaves a bad taste, I think it was very much a learning experience for the organization of you actually have to give your young players a shot, you know, in situations that, you know, you might be not thinking that they're ready for. And well, and again, I think winning helps give those shots. True, I agree. But it, it's one of those things that, you know, I, I think that, like, you, uh, I do not think that the Flames want to see, like, say, like, if they were to keep Dubé as, like, your third-line guy, you know, and then trade him down the road and him blossom. I don't think they want to see a repeat situation. So I think, I think they're those are two very different situations though. I mean, Ben is oh, one of the highest draft picks in history for the team and, and Dubay's not like, I think those are, those are going to play out very differently down the road, but for sure you want to see what you've got in Dubay either way. Mm-hmm. Um, interesting though, to kind of see Manjapani use our, our, you know, tied for the league scoring as what we'll call on the third line right now. And, and I think that's just sort of interesting where he's playing in the lineup, but still in the success that he is. Uh-huh. And it's going to be interesting because, I mean, you were talking about, you know, the backline line, the Pitlick and Coleman is not going anywhere. I don't think the Goudreau, Lindholm, Kachuk line is going anywhere. I mean, their minutes might change. So yeah. really then, like you said, you've got Monaghan, Mangiapane, Dubé as your third line. And then what does that leave you? Um, Richardson. Richie, Lucic, and Lewis? Yeah, with Richardson in there as well whenever he's healthy as a good fourth line and you know you were talking earlier about these young guys needing time to play and this is one of the reasons i wasn't upset when the flames brought in guys like good branson this year because you need not only do you need young guys to play but you need solid veterans from to work with and i think like richardson um you know good branson we're seeing guys, some of those veterans being able to step in and even when we look at you know manjapani dube and richie and another veteran guy there it's giving us that sort of those anchors on our lineup. Yeah, and like, what if Boone, uh, Good Branson has been to Yusuf Valamaki? Like, he's been able to have a little bit more space to make some riskier plays. I think plays. you could even argue ten to Shillington. That was the very next person I was going to mention. Like, you know, and Zadorov is Zadorov, and he will play again at some point, but. You know, like, Tanev has allowed Shillington to play his game and emerge. And, you know, like, yes, Shillington hasn't been perfect, but he's been a lot better. And he's actually looking like a top four defenseman. Which, that's huge for the team moving forward. Like, if you can actually rely on Shillington to be a top four defenseman, like, that's an amazing thing for this team. But yeah, it, and I think with you know, like you were saying, good Branson is you know helping Valimaki. Shillington's looking good. Valley's looking good. I think when Zadorov comes back in, I think either you take good Branson out for him, or you're gonna have to. I uh, ask you right now. I think that's the only option. Yeah, I think that what you would see is Shillington possibly uh, moving to the right side. And well, that's playing. what I think. Yeah, yeah. You'd, you'd switch the pairs, but in terms of bodies dressed, yeah, I think you'd have a Shillington Valimaki pair. Shillington on the right. 
Valley on the left, and then you'd have Zadorov Tanev as your number two. Yeah. But yeah, it'll be interesting to see, like especially as the season rolls on, um, like uh, how like the young guys will improve their game with the veteran players. And I just like that the uh, two veterans, Tanev and Goodbranson, have really stabilized their defense pairing and looked like very good players on those defense pairings. I agree, and and a lot of people gave the Flames some flack for bringing Good Branson in. I thought since the beginning, at the price they paying him, it's a good pickup, and I think we're yeah. seeing that here. We're not expecting him to be a top four D man, but as a five six seven D man, he's looking pretty good. No, and you look at like the the same uh, gaff that everybody gave uh, the Flames when they signed uh, Derek England to that three year contract, and like, oh wow, you really overpaid him, and yet. He, frankly, was one of the best defensemen on the team the entire time he was here and was instrumental in us beating Vancouver in the playoffs that year. See, and I don't know if I would have, like, if we're comparing the two, I would not have given Good Branson three. But I think no. one year at less than two, you can't go wrong with that. No, 29 exactly. 29-year-old guy, not even 30 yet. No, I think I, if we're and, looking at Good Branson to be a top four guy, yeah, maybe there's some issues there. But as a depth guy, I think great signing. Yeah, and like it, you know, if this is how Good Branson's going to play for this team, you know, would you want him back? Yeah, probably for another two or three years. But to be that number six guy that that anchors that third pairing, but you know, it's one of those things that we'll see. It's just a, a nice start to the team for this season, and you know, hopefully things carry on as you know. We're getting into the upcoming month of the season and all that kind of stuff. And we have yet to see this season Michael Stone play. He's the defenseman that has yet to play. But I think, you know, again, he's a veteran that we've seen who can jump into the lineup very quickly and, you know, look like a, a an NHL caliber guy even when he hasn't played for a while. And I think he's going to be one of these guys that is going to be very useful for the Flames when we start getting injuries. Oh, yeah, for sure. And... Basically, the way I look at it is with Good Branson and Stone signing at the end of uh, free agency, I think that was basically the Flames uh, taking care of their uh, trade deadline shopping before the season even began. Because now the Flames have eight quality NHL defensemen in the NHL and a good young guy in Connor Mackey that could step in easily as a number nine. And that like, seems to be what Tree likes to buy at the deadline is depth defensemen. Yeah, and like at this point, like you don't need to go get another defenseman or two at the deadline, like unless the Flames run into like three or four long term injuries back there. Well, and even at that point, I think if we run into three long term injuries, you're probably not going very far at that point. Uh, again, that would just depend on who. <laughs> but yeah, I agree. Like if you're if you're at the point where you've got three, I mean, if we look at this lineup, we've got Hannafin, Anderson, Tanev. I'd say who are legitimate NHL guys. If the other three get hurt, you can probably plug. But if those three are the three that are hurt, or two of those three, you're done. Yeah, and I so. think you you could say that of basically every team in the NHL. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Um, interesting stat, Matt. The Calgary Flames have not trailed in a game this year since the first game against Edmonton. Yep. And, you know, they've played like it. You know, um, their effort level has been impeccable through all six games. Like, even the game against Edmonton, you know, if they didn't run into as good of a goaltender in that particular game, then, you know, the Flames could easily be 5-1-1 one, and one or 4-0-2. Oh, you know, it's... You know, stuff like that happens, but, you know, the effort level has been there for the Flames, and if they can keep that effort level up, they're going to be a handful for every team. Sure. Which that, that which that's the important thing. Like, that's what, you know, like you and I have been harping on for years is having that identity, playing your game, and playing it consistently, and we're finally actually seeing that. So hopefully that can carry on and continue. And, you know, I, I think we have to preface this. It feels good as a Flames fan right now that we're riding a four-game win streak, but things are going to go bad. Things oh, yeah, are for going sure. Things are going to, 
you know, take a turn. We're not going to win every game from here on out. So I think, you know, we, we've got to be ready for that. And like we talked about, it's about how the team will bounce back from that. Mm-hmm. Yep. And, and I think that's really the story at this point is when, when are we going to lose? Cause we're going to lose. And how do we react to that loss, both in that game when the going gets tough and the next game? Well, then on top of it, like the flames have been on the road for the last four games and the two, uh, home games that they, or the one home game that they had, they lost, and now they're going to be on a five-game homestand. Like, how are they going to play at home? Like, it, that's a different beast, frankly, than playing on the road, because you can kind of just focus on your game on the road, and, you know, like, how do they respond to that distraction? And then, like, after that five-game homestand, they're on the road for seven. So, like, you know, and then dealing with that whole situation. And, you know, like, Calgary has a lot of different uh, things that they're upcoming, that different adversities, and, you know, they'll have to see how they are able to cope with all of these different scenarios. And, you know, I'm, I'm glad that we're winning. Like you said, it's weird for us to win early, but I think winning early is the best thing for this team right now because it oh, builds for sure. confidence. We've seen in the past where they've looked bad at the beginning of the year. Then they've managed to put together some wins late in the season, and it's just too little too late. I'd almost rather, you know, if we're going to have a, a – if we're going to have a streak and there's going to be a point where it's, you know, three, four, five, six, even seven games, we're not going to look good in a row. We might lose in a row. I'd rather get the points on the board early so that we have the padding to weather that storm. Oh, for sure. And another thing that I am actually grateful for is that like basically from now until the end of November, the flames are mostly playing Eastern conference teams. And you look at like next month, like the next two games are playing Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, but next month, like they play Nashville, Dallas, uh, San Jose and Chicago, Winnipeg. That's it for Western conference teams. And then the rest are all against the East. Well, and even those Western Conference teams, I mean, you know, Nashville, not a division game. Dallas, not a division game. San Jose, a division game. Like, there's a lot of time to put up some points here against non-divisional rivals. Yeah, and, and it's also one of those things, like, if they lose a handful of those games and do have a little adversity, you're playing Eastern Conference teams, which is not... You're, you're not, not giving up a point to somebody ex- you care about. Exactly. And it's one of those, like, if you drop the game to Toronto and Ottawa, say, next month, do do you really care? Like, yeah, you lost, but do those points affect you at all? No, not at all. So... you know, looking ahead to this schedule, let's just talk about that upcoming November schedule. So like you said, the Flames have one more road game against uh, the Penguins tomorrow. We'll get to our predictions in a bit. Then they're back home for Philadelphia and Nashville, Dallas, New York, San Jose. Uh, about a two-week homestand. Then they go on the road for Montreal and Toronto back-to-back. Ottawa, Philly, Buffalo, New York, Islanders, and the Boston Bruins. Then they're home again for three. They've really only got one back-to-back the whole month, and they've even got a couple two- and three-day breaks. So I know we've heard in the past sometimes that this team has not a lot of practice time. And I think that, I mean, they're going to lose. They're, they're not going to go all of October and November undefeated, but I think when we do get that loss, there's going to be enough time either because we're at home and we have our ice to play on or we're on the road and we've got some practice time that they're going to be able to rebound from this. Yeah, I agree, and... It, it's one of those things that, like, frankly, like, this schedule is awesome for the Flames just due to the fact that, like, when they're on the road, you're on the road. And, and an easy road trip. Like, it's Montreal, yeah. Toronto, Ottawa, Philly, Buffalo, New York, Boston. You're not going, like, how often have we seen them go, like, Boston to Tampa? And, and then, then go all the way back. And then back. over Vancouver. Yeah. It, it's like you're actually geographically in the same general zone and you're not really going too far in any direction and you know it's basically going from like calgary to edmonton to vancouver to seattle back to calgary like it's not anything drastic in you terms could of- if you wanted to almost do a hub city on this trip once you're out of ottawa and i mean even for the canadian games you can almost do a hub city set yourself up for a week in one hotel and just you know day trip it almost to the other cities Pretty much. Like, it's a very good group for the next, like, 
couple weeks after. I think we mentioned this for the first time in the nineteen the uh, nineteen twenty season as well. But there, so for those fans that don't know, for every Eastern Conference team or every team not in your conference, you play them once at home and once on the road. And if you look at this, we're burning a lot of our series. Like uh, Philadelphia, we play them twice in a month. New York Rangers play them twice in a month, and then we're done. Yeah, I know same with times Pittsburgh. In the past too. We play Philly like once, you know, in October, and then once in March. Well, like, uh, say Pittsburgh, for example, like, we play them tomorrow and then at the end of November. Crosby and Malkin are not going to be back by the end of November. So we get to play both those Penguin games without those two guys in the lineup. Yeah, I didn't so, even think of that. I was just kind of thinking it, it just seems like it's better set up that way. Oh, I know. I agree. But, you know, like, a tangential bonus for the Flames is that, like, they don't even get have to worry about playing those guys this year. So, you know, like, that that's great. <laughs> you know, because, like, those two guys individually can burn you themselves. So, like, so I guess it, I should take that back. So we still do have some of those series. We played Washington this week, and the next time we play Washington is March. So yeah. we still have a couple of those, like, Eastern teams on either side of the loaf of the bread. Yeah, but at least they're getting a few of them out right away. So I had to stop here for a minute on the schedule. I'm like, what team is this? I, I didn't even realize that Arizona had gone back to the old Cyborg Coyote logo. Yep, which is a good thing. It's I'm just like, I haven't seen this logo forever. Who is this? Wow. Um, well, Matt, let's talk about this next week then in terms of our predictions, unless there's anything before the predictions that you want to cover that we haven't talked about. Yeah. Uh, so the Flames, before we talk next, are going to play three games. They're going to have a 5 p.m. start tomorrow night on Thursday, the 28th, against Pittsburgh. Then on the 30th, they're back at home for Hockey Night in Canada against the Philadelphia Flyers, an 8 p.m. start time in Calgary. And then Tuesday the 2nd, they play the Nashville Predators, 7 p.m. start time. So we got three games in the docket. Uh, last week, neither of us did very well. You thought we would win two, lose two. I thought we'd win one. Or I thought we'd win two, lose two, just two different ones. And so we both split down the middle and lost. Matt, what do you think for this week? Uh, Win, win, loss. So you think they win against Pittsburgh, they win against Philly, and they lose to um, Nashville? Yeah. Why is that? Uh, I think Reddick might get the start in that one. So Where do you play Vladar? Uh, probably the Nashville game. Interesting. Okay, so give him a home start. Yep. I think the Pittsburgh game, I don't want to say, is going to be an easy one, but I think the team's rolling on their away momentum. I think they'll win Pittsburgh. I'm going to go the opposite direction as you. I think they're going to win Pittsburgh, lose Philly, and and win against... Uh, I, I think there's going to be an added motivational win against Riddick. Yeah. And I think this team can do it. Yep. I don't even know how uh, I don't even know who the goaltenders are in Philly this year. Uh, Carter Hart and uh, I want to say Brian Elliott still. Okay. I remember for a long time that team had like new goalies every year. Yeah. Well, I know Carter Hart for sure, just because I know Hart's there. I just wasn't yeah. sure who else was with him. Yeah, I'm assuming it's here. I'm gonna look that up because I think I was it's gonna still say Elliott. to to the internet. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I like I knew that Elliot was there, but I'm thinking to myself, Elliot hasn't done anything there. It, did he get re-signed? I thought uh, his, Martin his Jones. Deal was there over. you go, Martin Jones. Okay, so a, a capable goaltender at least. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I think I don't know. Philly's one of these teams, sort of like I was saying earlier with New York. I feel like you never know what you're going to get with them. Sometimes they seem like they're a really good team. Sometimes they seem like they're a lousy team. Yeah, well, and that's basically been the Flyers pretty much since the 90s. Like, you know, like they can beat you on any given night, but they could also be an expansion team level bad as well. And, yeah. And for me, I think I would play, um, I think after Dan Vladar played in New Jersey and maybe had some questionable time in that game, I think you've got to put Markstrom in. I think I would go Markstrom in the Nashville game just because I think Riddick might be there. I would probably play Vladar in in the Philly game. I could see that. It, it, it that one's a coin toss to me. Uh, I like I I would expect to see him in one of the games, like because the Flames basically play every other day uh, from the thirtieth through the sixth. 
so I'm assuming that Vladar will get one of those games, and then you probably won't see Vladar again until uh, the Montreal game after that. But uh, the back to back, yeah. Because basically, what I'm um, I'm kind of seeing like just over the next little bit, because uh, uh, the Flames play uh, three games and four nights in Toronto, uh, Montreal, and uh, Ottawa. I could see them playing Vladar against Montreal because they're bad. Uh, then Toronto gets marks from, but then there's an afternoon game uh, on uh, Sunday again on the 14th against Ottawa. I could see Vladar drawing in that one as well, and then the rest of them are like your normal 5 p.m. start time. So like seeing like marks from play basically the rest of the week. Riddick is out right now. Oh, um, I'm just looking. I'm looking on the NHL set. I don't know if he'll be back by then, but UC Soros and Connor Ingram are the uh, goaltending tandem that's active for those guys. So, oh, Riddick has been added. What was the date on this? The 16th, so 10 days ago, he was added to the COVID protocol list. So, 10 days ago, yeah, he'll probably be back by by that game then. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I was thinking. I I thought I haven't heard him being hurt or anything, but yeah, the 16th. It's what a 10 day quarantine. Today's the 20. The 26th, so yeah, he'll be back by that game, pending it is, you know, nothing serious. Yeah. Um, that That's where I could see him making his return, you know. Yeah, that makes sense. Just on their side, you know. And plus, I'm sure that teams like to have goalies play their old team just to, you know, because there's like that added motivation to stick it to your old team, so, you know. Do you think it, you'd get cheered or booed in the Dome? Uh, I think that he'd get cheered. Like, how would you say? Like, there's no uh, animosity. Like, it, it was the Flames were kind of like giving up on the season. The Flames uh, moved so. him. Yeah. He didn't ask to move on, or he didn't, you know, leave in a huff or anything like that. We moved him. Yeah, it's not like where like there was a little bit of disgruntledness, like say like with the Dion Phaneuf trade, where you know like. It was kind of like, yeah, and then, like, the Flames booed him afterwards. You know, like, there wasn't that angst against the player at all. Uh, You know, like, everybody liked Riddick, and it was just circumstances that caused him to move on. And so, yeah. You were talking earlier where you think Vladar will pencil in. Should we pencil him in for the November 18th against Buffalo, or should we write that in pen? I think you can write that in stone, (laughs) even... You know, look, get the chisel out. <laughs> like, that's not a game we need Markstrom and Ned for. No. Like, Maybe I don't that... care that Buffalo's doing good right at the moment. You know that's not going to last. And, yeah, that one in stone. <laughs> you can at least tell them now. Start prepping for, you know, three weeks from now. You're going to be a net, kid. Well, especially, like, the next games after that are uh, the New York Islanders and Boston. I think, even though it's a back-to-back, I think you see Markstrom play both. So allowing a couple of days extra off for Markstrom to play the back-to-back makes a lot more sense. And even if you did, like you said, in Ottawa, if you had Vladar in Ottawa, um, Markstrom in Philly, Vladar in Buffalo, and then you played Markstrom two in a row, I, I think that would probably be a good workload that week. Yeah. But I, I'm, I'm excited to see Vladar get a, a start in the Dome. And I think mm-hmm. this week's the week to do it. Whether it's the Philly game or the Nashville game, I think it's got to be one of those two. And it seems like the Flames want to give him regular work, which hasn't been the case with our backups the last couple of years. It's usually been we ride one guy until we can't. Yeah, well, the thing is, is that Vladar being 23, like, he's a good enough goalie where, like, he's shown at the AHL level that he's very good you have to see whether or not like there's more there there with him because like with any good young goalie you know he might be one of those elite goalies of the future you don't know and the only way to see what you have there is to play him and you know if he takes off and is amazing well that's one hell of a third round pick (laughs) yeah no it's it's true could be a very good pick or it could be a not so great pick but yeah. it's what we've gotten we've got to we got to make it work yep and i think we can and, and i think also not only can we make it work i think it's a good um 
How should I say this? I think it's a good model for young guys like, say, Dustin Wolf coming in to say, wow, I'm coming in, and the team is willing to give young backup goaltenders a shot, and they're willing to give me that play time. And I think if I was a, a young guy in a system where Markstrom was here, I might not feel like I was going to get that. Um, so I, I think that, you know, if you can set that up for success for this goaltender, or if this goaltender is not the right one, a, you know, a goaltender in the future, I think that you're saying this is sort of our belief in young goalies. Yeah. And, you know, like you look at, like, even down the road for this season, you know, like when it comes time for the playoffs, if the Flames are doing well and are in a good playoff position and all that, and you have a guy in Markstrom as your playoff starter, and he's only played, say, 55 games versus 65. Like, he's a lot fresher. Like, if the Flames do go on a playoff run, you know, you're not dealing with fatigue from your goaltender because he's fresh and ready to go. Whereas if he's, you know, already played 65 games and then you're asking him to play 10, 15, 20 games more like he's gonna be tired by the end of that and you know the it's one of those where it's beneficial both to vladar getting that regular time but also for marks from when the games are actually important and matter that he has gas left in the tank ready to go i agree and i think that's the big thing we've got to manage those minutes for uh markstrom and we can't be you know and if the flames do end up getting to the point where they need to if they get to the point where they need to win, you can't start riding our goalie, which we've seen in the past, because then there's no gas left for the playoffs. Exactly, and like that's where, like having Vladar play well enough where he's won his games, you know, like if he can play well enough where he's winning a good portion of those games, like that's huge for this team. Like if you can actually rely on your backup to win then you, you don't need to worry about, like, oh, well, if we throw him in there, it's a guaranteed loss night, and oh, well, you know, we need the time off for the starter, so mm -hmm. oh, well. You and know. that's what we need. We need to get him working so we have two goaltenders we can trust. Mm -hmm. Well, Matt, let's leave it there. Do you want to sign us off for this week? Um, as always, go Flames, go, and beat those Penguins. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.